Hi there, this is Kate Elliott. Welcome to Narrative World Season 2. I'm going to skip the introduction because a lot of you have already seen this, and I'm going to go straight to introduce to this month's guest. This is Saladin Ahmed, is the Eisner winning author of Black Bolt, and he's also written numerous titles for Marvel Comics, including The Magnificent Ms. Marvel and Miles Morales' Spider-Man. He's published creator-owned comics like Abbott and the new, the new one, Dragon, the new graphic novel Dragon, which is a whole other interesting topic, which we may or may not get to today. He's been nominated for the Campbell, now the Astounding, called the Astounding Award, the Nebula, the Hugo, the Locus, the Eisner, the Dragon, and the Ignite Awards, and won the Locus Award for Best First Novel for his fantasy novel, Throne of the Crescent Moon. He also writes short fiction and poetry. Saladin, welcome. Do you want to add anything to that introduction? <laughs> Maybe take something away from it. No, it's a, <laughs> yeah, no, it's um, thanks. I will, I'll, I will add something to it is that part of the reason that people uh, paid attention to Throne in the first place was because Kate here was, was kind enough to be an, an, an early reader and, and blurber. So, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, full circle stuff. It's nice. I, I actually think this brings us straight into the topic, right? <laughs> For one of the reasons that I was interested in reading it is because it was doing something with a genre I loved, but something that was revisiting and repurposing it. So I always ask when I ask people onto this, onto narrative worlds, there's people who I know, who I know I can talk with for an hour. Um, and then I ask them what they want to talk about. And you suggested the topic old bottles, new wine, revisiting and repurposing worn genre tropes and archetypes, which I, which I love because it's my whole career. So um, I, I'm just gonna tell you, open up this treasure chest of a topic. <laughs> Gosh. Um, you, thought, you thought I was gonna make this easy for you. Yeah, a little <laughs> no, bit. No, um, no, uh, no. <laughs> You know, it's a little, it's, 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 um, it's a little funny because I've been, I guess I was thinking in broad terms, in terms of kind of what would be appealing to folks mm -hmm. um, to talk about um, that wasn't strictly formally limited to prose fiction, right? Um, despite yes. the kind of a CIFA auspices here, uh, because, um, uh, because I've not been doing that for the past uh, X number of years. You know, I've been um, really working almost exclusively in, in comics and a uh, little bit in like TV stuff and podcasts and other things. And um, so I've really been thinking more and more um, uh, about these questions kind of thematically and um, as kind of uh, story elements that transpose between these these forms, you know, and uh, um, like what is the commonality when I think about in my own work and work that I love, um, and and how you know what what tropes get used and turned on their head across those forms, regardless of the form, right? Um, right now, I'm also I'm spending a lot of time as a, um, I don't like the word consumer, <laughs> as a uh, appreciator of art um, uh, and one who is trying to be entertained in a, in a pandemic. Um, in the past year, I've spent a lot less time, almost no time reading novels or watching TV like I typically would do tons of, and have been playing tons of video games that were sort of very story-based. And so I've just been thinking about like kind of how um, for me, this stuff is not locked to form, but is more a question of kind of telling certain kinds of stories differently, whatever the form might be. You know, and one of the reasons I asked you, there's many reasons I asked you, um, partly because I knew we could talk for an hour, that's what, but, but it's because of this comics background, be, because SIFWA has opened up now to games and comics. Yeah they have expanded because they also see that narrative is shifting. We're in one of those huge shifts. 
And I actually think that exactly what you're talking about, this idea that we have to tro transpose these tropes and archetypes and that we can do it in these different media matters. It, it's actually crucial to culture, I would say from my own political stance, because we have to transpose and change these like, these, these hammered in ideas that we imbibed, right? We, it's like we, we sucked it up as children. And then it, in, you know, it becomes part of us. But as, as artists, we have a chance to re-see those, you know, to, to change them in ways rather than to just repeat those old forms. Um, can you talk a little bit about how you have done that? Or actually talk about anything you want, actually. You don't have to follow my questions. I'm very, no. free, I'm very free form. Oh, we lost, we lost a little lamb without them. Um, I, yeah, no, I think um, I think that I don't I don't if I made a face it's because I don't know how successful I've been. I mean, for me, it's been hey. it's been an ongoing project to try to um, engage and reclaim, you know, some of these forms. And uh, um, it's interesting because it, I think it's harder and harder the more you telescope out. Um, you know, I really, I really. I'm leaving aside kind of juvenilia, I guess. Uh, I, I really started as a, as a series, as a published writer, I guess, with poetry, you know, and um, um, a very uncompromising kind of poetry that was exactly what I wanted it to be and did used forms the way I wanted them to be used and, and spoke to an audience of 12 and, you know, and, and it was about this narrow, right? And then, um, and then I, I, began to write short fiction, right? And um, the audience got a little bigger and, but there was some more compromise with form, I think, and uh, with, um, with market and form and market are so intertwined, right? Um, <clears throat> you talk about the political ramifications and, um, you know, all of this stuff is, um, uh, is politically driven as well, right? We have to be attended to kind of what that means. If we're, if we're thinking more and more across forms as storytellers, part of the reason I'm doing it is because I know corporations are, right? And so um, nobody, when you go out trying to sell a story now, um, it's um, to get a certain level of buy-in um, from those who own the means of production to get Mark system out of it. Um, go for it. Uh, you, um, you need to speak to the story's appeal outside of particular forms because all of these rapacious corporations are trying to buy up the next like whatever universe, right? And, and so they're trying to tell stories across X, Y, and Z forms. And it's, it's this bizarre thing because it's incredibly appealing as, as a creator, as an artist, as a writer to engage these different forms. I thrive with that personally, you know, but it's also... It's the logic of the market that um, that that's really how we're all operating now, and so it's it's a uh, you know it's it's like a it's a tricky back and forth for me um, dealing with any of those particular forms, and I kind of I kind of try and be aware and sort of both hold my nose enough to be effective when I'm engaging something bigger than me, right, and uh, and also kind of be aware with myself what my real lines are, right, and so. When you go yeah, from yeah. poetry to, to short fiction, to novels, to, to like corporate owned comics, to television, right? Like the reach, right? I mean, I have, you know, most of my family is, doesn't read novels, you know, most of my family does not, most people I know who are not other writers don't read novels. They don't read comic books even, they, you know, they watch TV. So, yeah. so you think about what does that platform mean? And how compromised is the form inherently before you ever get there? And it's, but, uh, it's daunting. It's daunting. But can't, an argument can also be made because I hear what you're saying. It's one thing to write for a niche audience. And one thing that novels does is that does allow a person to write for a small audience. Um, maybe not, maybe not as a full-time job, but they can but you can get that readership of a thousand people, five thousand people, ten thousand people, um, but, and it is true that the bigger it gets as you as you go out, that 
I don't know. I mean, we could say compromises, we can say self censorship, we can say getting a foot in the door, but there's the flip side of that surely is that even small things can seem revolutionary. I, you know, I just watched the new, the first episode of the new Star Trek, Strange New Worlds. And of course it's set before the original series with Captain Pike. And we see um, Uhura as a cadet, right? So back in the day, as we know, on the original series, she was a lieutenant, right? She was Lieutenant Uhura. Mm -hmm. On just a single black woman being on the bridge of a starship, and this has been said a million times, and it's still true, was revolutionary at that time in 1968 or 67. Um, so, in a way, even if what you're doing, as it gets bigger, if, even if what one is doing seems small compared to what you can do in a novel, surely it is having, it can have a, an outsize effect. You see yeah. what I'm saying? Yeah. So I, I, I mean, I mean it's the only I, reason I, to do it. <laughs> I mean, but, I wouldn't say, so I don't know about, is there something in, revisiting and repurposing that isn't so much about the purity of the vision, but reaching people, even yeah. in a small way. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I, I um, again, just pop forms. I mean, I, you know, I have, a, I have an MFA in poetry from Brooklyn College where it was like experimental, you know, where Ginsburg yeah. used to teach. And, you know, I mean, like, um, I, like, I have that side of me, you know, um, but it, um, and, and, you know, every once in a while, like, I write something, sometimes things that never see the light of day that are for myself that, uh, that really are fucking weird and engage that, you know, um, but I, I, especially the older I get, I feel like the more, um, the more it it just feels like writing really needs to be an act of communication to me, and um, and and I'm I'm needy in the way that many writers are and don't admit to themselves. I'm emotionally needy, and uh, and uh, I need uh, <laughs> and you know that that dopamine from engagement. You know, um, I'm, I'm I just worked on. Uh, a podcast called Batman Unburied, right? And I was just one of one of a couple of writers on it, but it's it's currently a dethroned Joe Rogan uh, ratings wise, right? Number one podcast on Spotify right now. Amazing. Yeah, Amazing. it makes me happy. And um, it's uh, and it's you know whatever it's 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 full of cool things that we achieved, and it's called full of compromises also. But um, the the thrill of just seeing the sheer number because it's in the millions of, of people who are going to listen to this, as opposed to say like in the thousands of, of, yeah. of other things I've worked on, right? And just seeing that, it's like, it's powerful, it's powerful. And so I will always, as a writer, um, I, I will always wear on my sleeve the fact, because I don't think enough of us are honest about that, that, you know, like a lot of us didn't have certain kinds of approval at various points in our life. And, <laughs> and that's, uh, that, that fuels part of what we're doing here. And, uh, and so I, to me, um, I'm, I'm a little shameless about the fact that, uh, you know, I want to make people happy. And, uh, and, and there are certain kind of familiar forms, familiar types of characters, familiar rhythms to stories that are going to make them happy in a way that uh, a different kind of challenge might not. And, and, and it's, it's maybe the easy way out. I think we need all kinds of writers, but the kind of writer I am is, is probably that one who is going to give them comfort food rather than something you know, else. I wanna, I wanna come swing back around to this idea that it's an easy way out. I, don't, I think culture, and especially in an empire like the United States, which is a deeply complex, very um, filled with influences from all over, I, I don't think it is necessarily the easy way out if we only define hard as, as having this narrow line, almost doctrinaire view of what is allowed. Because I agree with you about communication. I mean, writing is also translation because when I read 
anything you write, I'm always to some degree translating it to myself, right? I can't help that because I don't have your experience. I only have mine. So everything I read I'm, is, is a form of translation, but it's also a form of me touching a little part of, of the writer. Or I, I think of this when I read source work, when I read Vidupin de Corve, which who was like one of my main source materials when I wrote the Crown of Stars epic fantasy mm. series. And mm. I would read him and I thought, man, I'm, I'm like touching him. Yeah. However, briefly through translation, because I don't read medieval or 10th century German, but, but how wild is that? Really? Yeah. No, that there's can, some, there's, so there's a, there yeah. That, like, you know, and that's, and again, like I come from poetry originally and, uh, and that is, that is something that, um, you know, it's, it's, and, you know, we'll talk about this eventually, but in, in my own work, it's been both profoundly satisfying to work with super familiar characters that people had a relationship with before I ever came to those characters. Oh, how interesting. And, but also to always preserve something that, that's me, that I made, because you can lose that intimacy um, uh, in a way that um, when you're, when you're kind of doing, when you're telling stories in other worlds, um, you know, rather than those you built, you can really you can you can lose that connection. It's a the the um, the Black Mountain School poet Charles Olson, back in the day, uh, right? Um, he kind of described poetry as an energy transfer between people, oh, and it's it's, like it's, it's, it's really interesting to me. It's like you know you you have this energy in your brain, you put it on this piece of paper. Somebody else picks it. It's like a you know a almost technological thing. And right? somebody else picks it up, they read it, and that energy fills them. And it, and it's it, it was it, it was very proto hippie, but um, but I think it um you know it, it it always spoke to me and continues to speak to me when I think about what we're trying to do with art. And you know um, it's always a question of kind of maintaining that despite scale. Sometimes when you're working with some of these other worlds and characters. It, this reminds me also of the whole discussion of fan fiction, because when people read fan fiction, they're arriving at the story that's been written on, you know, archive of our own or, or wherever else it may be posted online with, the, with, as you say, a prior relationship with those people and with those characters, they already have a sense. And there's also that sense that the writer of the fan fiction, or in your case, uh, the writer of a previously written of, of a Spider-Man, there's a history there that we that the writer doesn't have to explain. All they have to explain is what they're doing with this specific piece, right? And which, but when when we write a completely secondary world, one that we have created ourselves, we have to explain every piece. We have to build that relationship. And it's true that that puts a barrier for some readers they they don't it takes them too long to yeah. find that hook where they can say oh i relate to this now there's a, a whole audience as, as you know well uh I, I used to work in a public library as a kid out of high, out of high school and um it, there, there was an entire readership that only checked out like star wars novels or star yeah. trek novels or and that those are the only novels they read right? it was like this franchise that they wanted more of they never read like an original science fiction no. but the thing is interesting to me is it's like do do we invent our own stuff do we really build it from the yes. ground because yeah. coming back to like the talk which you know drifting way the hell away from but whatever no 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 this is all um, part of it is you know um yeah it's built it, they're, they're built out of pieces that are not like yeah um kind of how do I put it what's the the metaphor I'm looking for the the building blocks are not quite so systematized right but they're still building blocks that are kind of yeah. to some degree pre-made in most cases right it's the rare writer that's like doing something completely from scratch right and then you usually just look at it like what is this because exactly then they sell a hundred copies because nobody yeah. can <laughs> yeah so but but no uh, I was gonna to say yeah exactly that we need people. One of the things about the old bottles is that we need them. They're, that's our, that's our, those are our gates and our windows, a way people can come in. I mean, like your, your, um, 
recent novels have been sort of like on the one hand you've got like a big fat space opera -y book and then a big fat fantasy-ish book um, no no my most recent fantasy was a novella i'm just telling you the wait, black wolves Oh, oh no, that was yeah. This is no, I have a new novella oh, that just came out this year. Hey, you're, you're too fast for me. That's okay. So the last, I'm, 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 but I yeah, have to but apologize. Black Wolves is a big fat fantasy so, novel. That is so, true. Yes. Um, and you do, you know, you just people look at that book on the shelf, right? Well, back when they went to physical bookstores, <laughs> and they and they and they they have some notion of what they're looking. At. You're not, um, you know, everything from your cover art to kind of some of the characters or at least what some of the characters start to look like at first gloss, right? And then, um, and, but it's, it's, it's a hook, you know? I mean, it's not deceptive. There will be comfort food for people in there, but you know, you're somebody who's like whatever for however many years been using that to then do something different and to, and to introduce different kinds of characters, but also different kinds of concerns, you know, um, in terms of like, you know, what are these, what matters to these characters? What are they trying to achieve? And so, you know, to me, that's like, that's what it's about is, um, is, is finding that sweet spot. You know? I, I agree because I think this is really true in whatever medium or, an artist is working in that we try to create that bridge. And I think as writers, I know I do this, which is I try to start with something that makes sense to people that many readers can hook into, it, it, whatever that might be. I'm a, I'm a dude and I'm in the forest with my crew of dudes and we're about to ambush somebody. Well, we've all been there somewhere in, in, in our genre, especially in American fiction, right? We know that feature, mm -hmm. but then you're right. It's a, so it's like your entry point. And I, I think for me, one thing in terms of, as you say, revisiting and repurposing is taking that familiar entry point and then starting to pull it in a direction you don't go or putting a different person as the central character, the one you don't expect yeah. and seeing you know, we can actually, that, that whole element of changing who the focus is on and what it does to the trope or the archetype is a fascinating one to me. Yeah, it's radic and radically uh, under, um, I don't know, underestimated, I think, you know. Yes. Um, I think because, um, well, with a caveat, right? I mean, to me, <clears throat> if you tell... Okay, so, um, and, and yes, I'm afraid I'm gonna re refer to my own work here, right? Um, uh, but- No, I'm telling, I, I ordered you to. I'm just, <laughs> taking you off the hook. Yes, behind the scenes, I was, I was told to everybody, I'm not that much of an egomaniac, but. Um, so Abbott, I, I am an egomaniac, but um, I usually hide it better than that. I, Abbott is a comic that I, I, I wrote recently, uh, drawn by Sammy Cavella and uh, colored by a, a couple of different folks. Um, and, uh, it's, we've got two volumes of it now. And it really, um, it started with kind of like a couple of different familiar archetypes. And one of them was the sort of the paranormal detective, right? Um, it's, it's a pretty direct tribute in some ways to uh, uh, the 1970s TV show, Kolchak, the Night Stalker, right? Which was a, this show about this reporter in Chicago, white guy, middle-aged white guy who, um, like hunts the monster of the week, basically. Um, and so um, Elena Abbott is the main character of this series and uh, she's a reporter in Detroit in the seventies and um, she's a black woman, a bisexual black woman. And uh, it's both that trope of the kind of like dogged uh, uh, paranormal detective, the, the kind of seeker into the unknown and what she, um, a bit of a spoiler, but we're two volumes in and it's not a huge one. Um, you know, she's got a bit of chosen one to her, right? She's told in the first volume by the kind of, by a wizard, right? Basically that she's, she is the light bringer, right? And um, the, the, there's absolutely some very familiar beats there and it's 1000% it's intentional. And it's, it's 
1000% um, me saying that I think that when you, um, when you put a different type of character in those kind of situations, those archetypal overused um, for young white boys <laughs> situations, mm -hmm. um, I think this, the situations transform and become something interesting again. They don't become unproblematic and, it's, and she's not treated as some unproblematic chosen one in there. But, um, but, um, but she's like, you know, she's the destined one to save us from the demons kind of thing. And um, it's, it, it just, it's different. It's different, you know? Um, it does some of the same things that are still problems, but it does a lot of work that um, rather than telling the same old stories about the world, it tells different stories about the world, you know? I, this, because, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, please. No, because this exactly reminds me of um, an entire kind of discussion that went on maybe five or six years ago about the, I call it the princess at the ball in her beautiful ball gown, right? So this is a trope that a lot of girls in the United States, especially, I can't speak for elsewhere, grew up with. We wanted, you know, we were told that what we should want to be is the princess in the ball. At the, I have the most beautiful ball gown, or I finally take my glasses off and am found and, and dressed up and have found to be beautiful. And in many ways, it's an incredibly regressive story, partly in part because of the whole concept of monarchy, which of course is not, oh God, there's a whole sidebar I could go on about how monarchy is not always a regressive story. You need <laughs> no, no, no. to put it in context. Like monarchy in Hawaii is not a regressive story. It's a story about yeah. sovereignty, right? Um, yeah. which, which I won't go into, but anyway, the princess at the ball. But what happens if you put a black girl in that role, a black girl who societally in the United States has been told she can't be beautiful. She's not blonde, she's not light skinned, she can't be beautiful. And now she's put in the role in which everyone says she's beautiful, she's the belle of the ball. She's the most beautiful girl at the ball. That's, that means something on many levels. It, in a way it's received and in, in the message it's given, I don't I hate that word message, it's not the, What's the word I'm looking for? It just, it shakes things up, but it also forces truth. Sure, and what it says to people I, yeah. without being a, a message. I, I hear right, you. and yeah. it's, and it also upsets some people. Yeah. And there is something and, to be said for upsetting people. You know, the, I think the, the thing that's so interesting and a bit discouraging is that, and you know, I deal with this on, on, a, on a different kind of axis um, is that, it's just as in a very uh, tentative, you know, uh, an inch of ground way, um, just as people of color, black people specifically, because they've been the kind of people who've kind of been at the forefront of kind of carving out diversity in an unwilling uh, set of industries, but um, mm. um, women as well. But, you know, I, I, I think that it's not, coincidence to me that as soon as we start to see some of these admittedly problematic kind of roles um, diversify in terms of who here and there a little bit starts to get considered for them, uh, suddenly there are some folks, nominally progressive folks who, who um, want to just throw the whole thing out. Maybe it's not sudden. I mean, it's certainly there's, you know, there's like, you know, with some of the um, the princess archetype that you're talking about, there's been a long-standing and well-founded kind of feminist opposition to it, but the kind of refusal to just see that like, it doesn't mean everything is not from your point of view and, yes, and does not exactly. the same thing to everybody is, you know, it's, 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 um, it's interesting because, so with men of color, it's, it's a really interesting thing to me, um, working in really kind of hyper, archetypal subgenres, right? Like uh, uh, superhero comics or, or cyberpunk stuff or whatever it is. Um, you know, there's horrible traditions uh, in terms of kind of women being prizes, right? You win, you beat the bad guy and then, you know, you get the girl right. kind of thing, right? right. Um, uh, we have to dismantle that at the same time that we have to kind of think about like, 
it, if that story was part of what it meant to be a man, to really be a full man, and really what that means in, in a patriarchal society is to be fully human, right? right. Then, then who got excluded from that? Yeah. And, and, and do those, do those do clumsy efforts sometimes at reclamation that might partake in some of that stuff and some of those, genre, like, do you really think that's the same thing as somebody in power who's been telling the same story over and over again? And, and you know, you gotta have some, some nuance to the way that you, receive these, again, coming back to the, to the talk stuff, um, to the, these tropes, you know? Um, there are times when I fuck up using tropes and, and I'm happy to have it pointed out. And there are times where I'm very uh, aware that uh, imperfect usage buys, I think, something bigger. Uh, and so it's, it's, but it's a dance. It's always a dance to me. It, it, you know, it really is. And I think that's a crucial point that not only do not only is it complicated, but sometimes we have to, sometimes we, people end up moving by small measures, not just that one. I, it's, what, what is the famous saying? The perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think that relates to this in that sense that we're never gonna have a pure society where we all, you know, where the wrongdoer has to be seated on, can be seated on a chair on a stage and we can all tell them what they're doing wrong until they fix it. We, people aren't like that. I, it's also interesting, this idea of about problematic, investigating and repurposing and revisiting problematic tropes and archetypes, because sometimes people just love them. And I don't, I, I understand that the, the love for things that you just love and that you want to find some other way to tell. And sometimes, you know, speaking of big, large, absolute unit space operas, so I'm writing Alexander the Great in space, right? Now, yes. this is a story. I, I'm writing Alexander the Great in space, only gender swapped. Partly because I, I am kind of an Alexander fangirl. My oldest son is named Alexander. Um, <laughs> he, he's the first, I, I had twins and I said, I'm like, first through the breach will be Alexander because he's the one who <laughs> always did that, right? Right, um, which I find hysterical. He's the one who went into the military, by the way. Um, it's so funny. But, but the thing is, is like, this means I'm writing a story about war and conquest and empire building. I am not a fan of, and so this, I'm saying this flippantly so that you understand as a Danish American, I'm being very serious. I am not a fan of war and conquest and empire. I am not telling this story because I think it's good, but I wanted for what reason, I don't really know. To tell a story of a truly charismatic, successful leader, mm -hmm. but make that person a woman because I, it, and it's in a society where there is no overt, um, that it's not a patriarchal society. So right. that, that, that changes things. Um, but because I felt that this is a role that we, that I have rarely truly seen women in as if they're not quite capable of it. And I hasten to add that I also have written, because I've been writing for a while, stories in which you see women, like in, in the Crossroads trilogy, the main, the lead character, such as there is one, it's a cast of thousands, um, is in a very, she's, and she's wonderful, one of my favorite characters I've ever written, my, she's very much a, a woman who functions within traditional views of patriarchal womanhood, because I also wanted to write that story and center a story about seeing her agency. So, mm -hmm. so one could read Unconquerable Son and think, oh, she just thinks that women can only be cool when they're in a man in a traditionally male role. Um, but so I knew there was that risk and that there remains that risk because the second book is also very long and it's full of war. Um, and command, right? And yeah. her making this whole thing happen, but I just wanted to do it. And yeah. a part of it is that as artists, I think for me anyway, sometimes I just want to explore things and see how they come out because I grew up with this and these are the things that matter to me. Mm. Um, yeah. And yeah, so oh. that's what, I mean, what are we, I mean, in a way, I guess I would, I guess I would say, aren't we, 
in conversation with the genre, with our genres, with our fields and with our history when we work. I mean, what do you think? I Because I feel like I'm writing in response to what I read when I was young and what I'm the world around me now, oftentimes. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And um, I mean, for me, it's, um, it's almost more direct than that. It's, uh, um, it's conversation, um, you know, at some points um, al almost bordering on, um, I, um, let me say this is a serious word, so I'm fucking around here, but almost bordering on plagiarism, right? Because I, yeah, I, I to me, it's, um, uh, you, you can call my works, it's not actual. <laughs> like, no, 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 I get it. Because there's so many people out there actually plagiarizing. But, but to me, you know, um, uh, hip hop, I grew up with hip hop as, as a pretty big influence. And uh, uh, the idea of sampling is always of yes. taking pretty direct pieces of something, messing with it a little bit, right? And then putting it beside other pieces of things, right? Um, pieces of other things that you might not think you'd see it next to, right? And, uh, and then you do that with a few different things and then you have a new thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. With really familiar pieces that it's made out of that you have not quite bothered to obfuscate that you sometimes played up the, uh, the origin of, right? The provenance of. Um, to me, that's, that, that, that's always kind of been at play in my writing as well. So, you know, there are definitely, um, you know, um, uh, Miles Morales will see somebody in the sewer and it's, it's it, you know, <laughs> and, 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 that, and that's okay because people like, you know, it's, sometimes it's a, it's a straight up gag, right? But sometimes it's like, oh, this is that moment. This is the, you know, we're canceling the apocalypse speech. This is the, uh, you know, like, there, there are nods in my work constantly that feel like they're, um, they're in conversation, but that by being put next to something else and again, having a different voice articulating them, um, you know, they become, they become something different, I hope, you know. But they do, to, uh, but they do, because that's part of, I mean, we're always, we, we, you said this earlier, but we are always building on what we already, on the foundation we already have, right? The one we, that we were born with, the one we grew up inside. I, I actually am not convinced that it's possible for an artist to do something totally, I don't wanna, I, I don't know even what the word I'm, something that's not connected. So when people say, oh, they're not really world building, they're not making things up, they're, they're, they're being completely, um, unique or whatever, but really, if you look at what they are doing, um, usually they're just repeating things that are come come from before. They're just they just don't have to fill it in because yeah. we know it so well, yeah. right? They you don't know, have to add any extra. To continue the the music analog a little bit, so like when hip hop first became very big, right? There was a huge backlash with like old white rock guys that were like. Oh, that's just, he just stole, they're just stealing records, you know, and, and, and talking over it and whatever. And, um, you know, the irony of it, of course, was that, um, you know, these are guys who like loved like whatever, Led Zeppelin, who loved like, you know, God love them, the Beatles, right? That were like that entire careers that had been based by kind of pasting together other stuff yeah. by other people, sometimes shamelessly, right? Yeah. And, um, um, but it wasn't like a literal sample on a record. So people didn't like see it that way, you know, combined with some racist reasons they didn't want to. And, and um, you know, to me, that's, that's always kind of the musical uh, equivalent is like, I, I sometimes am doing like a hip hop record where it's like, you can see this is a scene from XYZ movie, except, except she's Lebanese, <laughs> you know? Right. And it changes right. the dynamic, right? Um, or, um, and then sometimes it's more like, oh, you know, these chords, right? It's not a, it's not a straight sample, but it's, uh, you know, there's some familiar sounds in there. But I, I am very rarely like just out there blazing a trail as a composer that like, there are those writers that do it. And, you know, I mean, God, God, thank God for them. We, 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 they push us forward. But, um, but I think it takes all types, I guess. I really, really like your music, Anna analogy 
especially using the idea of using chords, you know, you think of the blues where one of the reasons you know it's the blues, even if the words and the music are different, um, is because it uses that chord progression. And, and that can be, as a writer, that, that analogy of the chord progression or the cadence or the structure, you know, I'm going to write a, how, however the book is structured, if it, those things too, that kind of the rhythm and the beat and the, the pull and the push of the way the story moves and the way the people fall in and out of it and the way the world is presented in terms of how much time you're going to spend, that all is part of what readers respond to or gamers respond to, you know, and or viewers respond to. And that's, and I really agree with you that as artists, we can use those as our stepping stones or, or again, our bridge or like our hand held out to say, here, you, you under, you, you hear this, you, this is familiar to you. Yeah. I want to, God, what time we tell? Let's see. All right. Do you want to go with a question? I am from, good. From yeah. Jose? I'm yeah. going to Edith. warn everyone at home that we've got some kind of windstorm going on outside. Okay. So, and, and the, uh, the, sometimes it does fiddle with the, uh, so if I suddenly disappear, I didn't flee this uh, yeah. it's because we got our, our, our internet knocked out. Fingers crossed. We should be. Let's, let's see how this goes. <laughs> okay. Um, Jose asks, as writers, how can we prepare to subvert a trope successfully and evoke in the audience what we intended? What is your approach to, what is your process to approach this? Great question. Um, I want to quickly, I'm going to let you think a minute. Quickly, one of the things we talked about before was you, you one way to approach it is to begin with something familiar, a familiar stepping stone so that the reader says, oh, I, I know this, um, the princess is, the, everyone has announced that the princess is coming, the most beautiful princess in the world is coming to the ball. We all know what that is, right? So then the reader says, oh, the most beautiful princess is coming to the ball. Um, and then you use that as your stepping stone for the reveal. So that's one, that's like a very basic option. Yeah, yeah, I think so. And I think for I think for most of us that are interested in, in doing that kind of work in our writing, um, it usually comes because there's um, there's something that we felt like we, we would like to mess with a little bit, that we love that we would like to mess with a little bit, you know? And so sometimes that's uh, an archetype that can transcend subgenres, the... Uh, you know, the, uh, the strong, silent killer with a past, right? Um, that's, you know, we just love that kind of story, right? Maybe it's something, a more developed subgenre, a Western. I was wanting to tell Western, right? Um, and I think that that to me is probably your starting point is to think about like, what, you know, what do you love that you feel like you have something to add to the way it's been done, Yes. right? And, uh, and, and then just start to think like, well, what is my version of this? look like, what, what's, what's different about it for me, whether it's a familiar character type, whether it's a familiar story term, whether it's a familiar subgenre. Um, yeah, and sometimes once you decide what you're gonna do and you have your, I, you know, I wanna think, of, I think about The Last Jedi, the, the film, the Star Wars film. And one of the things they did was they had that moment where Rose, what's her name, sister, it's early in the film, who does that, that classic thing where a minor character fighting for a just cause sacrifices themselves so that others can live or that the victory can be made, right? And this, and in this case, it's just, it's Rose's sister whose name I can't remember. Um, but she's a woman with, She's an Asian, I'm presuming an Asian American actor, but I don't know. She, when I watched it, I thought, whoa, I don't get to see this character as a, at A, as a woman, and B, as an Asian, a, a woman with Asian features. But she was just in the role. She did exactly the same things anyone would have done. And that, to me, as a viewer, by itself, without any explanation, just dropping her in 
that role, which is a role, a trope I love. The, the, oh, the, yeah, me too. the good death, man. Yeah, the oh, good I, death. I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm an overuser of it big time. Um, I have, have you I have ever, like, have you seen, I rewatched three different characters in yeah. comic books that I think blow themselves up. And it, it also feeds into bad Arab stereotypes for me, but you know, it's, but um, I no, but you know, what's funny to me is I go two ways with that, right? I give that valor to precisely as you're talking about the kind of character that never gets it. Yeah. And on the other hand, I'm also like, let the white guy die first, right? And yeah. so I, I like, yeah. <laughs> because it's always like, because there's that other long tradition of like characters of color that are expendable yeah. for a, a, a yeah. white hero story. And so my, my, my work is also, I'm afraid, littered with, uh, with white characters that we like that, uh, that, that, <laughs> that go bye-bye uh, heroically, you know, um, because it's their turn. <laughs> so. It's uh, it's again, I think, but none of these are just neutral usages of, of, of the trope. And I think that that's what, what I find interesting about them. And in terms of evoking in the audience, you know, when we both, both you and I talk about this with, with that, that sense of like, this is really the, I don't wanna, I'm gonna use the word passion. I'm gonna, with the passion, we're like really into it, right? We're like really engaged with what we're doing. And I think engagement, the engagement that any writer or artist brings to what they're doing will come across on the page, especially the more one gains experience, just the general experience of getting better at doing it, right? But that engagement itself is part of what evokes in the audience what we intended. I mean, the other side of it is that just sometimes you just make a lot of mistakes or you do a bad job at it and you figure out what you did that didn't work and you make it better. You know, I'm a better writer than I was 30 years ago, I hope, but I'm pretty sure I am. But so part of it is just doing it over and over again. Um, was, was it, do you have any, do you have any, if you have a follow up, please put it in Q&A. And if anyone else listening has a um, question, it goes in the little Q&A bar uh, thing, thing, the kind on the right hand side of the screen. <laughs> Um, hold on, I have a bunch of questions that we didn't even touch on because I knew we would just talk. <laughs> um, I, I actually have a question. You used both revisiting and repurposing. What do you see as the difference between those two? I see them as two different processes, but I'm interested in what you have to say about it. Oh, I think, um, uh... That may have partly been me being cute, but uh, I think um, I think that partially um, to me, if, if I was cute and subconsciously conveying something to myself at the same time, I think it was, um, you know, I think that some of these, as much as kind of I'm, I'm, I'm talking subversively, like, oh, let's reclaim these things and, and make them, you know, uh, okay again kind of stuff. There's also, it's as you're saying, some, you know, we just like stuff and and the stuff we like isn't always perfect and um mm -hmm. i think that there are there's lots of stuff in the genre landscape that uh, has its problems but has lots of great stuff to to celebrate you know and some um especially as i get older and um you know i, I look back on things that you know it's not like I didn't know they were fucked up when I was younger you know it's not like this is mm -hmm. like uh oh suddenly it's not okay to like this stuff anymore it's just um you know the relationship to your faves are problematic kind of thing uh is is um I think that sometimes it leads us to tr kind of try to want to exonerate stuff and and feel like it's okay to like things and um, so if I want to revisit tropes, I guess, or I want to revisit archetypes, I guess I just, um, I think there's some use in kind of looking at stuff that we've maybe, we've maybe cast aside as over familiar or, yeah. um, or, or yeah. painted and, and reclaiming what's useful. But I think there's also, uh, some of that stuff has to go and has to be radically transformed. So, so I guess that's the two valences there. That makes sense. Yeah. I'm also thinking about, again, I'm still thinking about Jose's question, because one of the other things that happens 
is changing the angle of view. So I'm, I always have a side project I'm poking on, which will be usually, a, which I'll either abandon at some point or will appear two or three years from now, right? Um, and I thought, oh, I wanna write a whole huge fantasy um, Roman tongue empire setting only there's all these other problems going on with it so it's in the slow collapse phase but what if i told the whole story from the point of view but where there's nobody no point of view characters who are from the nobility or from the higher ranks of society what if it's all from the people down below so it's the same story but you're seeing it you're viewing it from underneath um, because i've done those characters, but I haven't done a whole book with those characters. So right. would that be subversive? Is that, that's in a way that's revisiting a story that I could have told the other way and gotten a different view from. And I sometimes just think angle of view create is an approach. Just think about what this angle of view, how does it change how I look at the story? It's so Even, funny because when you say that, I think about like how many times I read when I, when I was writing fantasy prose fiction um, and I was kind of reading a lot about writing it because I was, was quite new to it, right? Um, it's so, um, people are so invested in the idea that somehow that's impossible to do because the movers and the shakers, like you have to be in the palace and in the, you know, in the room where it happened <laughs> to use yep. the, the Hamilton of it, right? And uh, it's it's hilarious to me that people don't recognize that as like brainwashing. It's like no, you don't. You really don't. You could tell, you know. But it, but at the same time that I mock it, um, you know, I in, in my one <laughs> complete novel, um, yeah, all the none of the characters are really noble. There's a but they do end up in the palace. They do end up interacting with nobility because because you have. You know, because even then you have that conditioning that says this is this is where the action is. This is where you have to pay attention to, and um, and of course that's not the case. There's nothing that says that's the case. But um, but we've been conditioned that way. Our readers have been conditioned that way, and so yeah. Yeah. Um, I, th I think like a, a, a not upstairs downstairs, but just downstairs. <laughs> you know, when uh, they said they were revisiting. Great. Downton and uh, upstairs downstairs. I was so yeah, excited because I thought downstairs. they were going to do upstairs downstairs only focus on the downstairs people, but no. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, forget this. I've seen it already. <laughs> I don't need it again. I no, but a fantasy version of that would be awesome because it would also like. I mean, even as you say that, right? I start thinking about like when you talk about angle of view, all that shit that like you know gets spelled out as palace intrigue in ten thousand novels, um, suddenly becomes almost like great old ones distant power that like oh. it doesn't make any sense doesn't you don't really know anything about what's going on out you know it's like it's totally obfuscating it becomes so much more interesting to try and tell a story about like power that doesn't get to be inside but probably sees what it really looks like because of that, right? Or if you look at servants mm -hmm. who see and hear well, there you everything. Go. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. But it also reminds me, this whole story about when you say you, you have to be with the movers and shakers, because otherwise the story isn't interesting. This same thing was told about, for example, women. Well, women in history never did anything. That's why they can't be in stories. And that's why I wrote my in Crossroads, mm -hmm. who's, who's crucial, but she never steps out she the only time she ever uses a knife is to cook things to cut up things in the kitchen i think she holds one once in a moment of terror uh when things are bad but then she doesn't have to use it uh, but she builds community she does she's a merchant she negotiates with people she does all these things that women were doing and women were doing everything um in the past just we just and you know and it's it's it. interesting because we, we because it's it's again i think it takes all types because the problem with taking some of these familiar tropes and familiar valorizations and, and archetypes is like we celebrate the same shit and uh and if we don't so i've written lots of badass swords women you know um mm -hmm. and lots of badass space soldier women and you know but um same same like 
it's just as you're saying, right? Like that, that, like, is that, like, is that the only way to tell a, a woman's story that makes her heroic and important more than right. any, more than heroic, right. maybe, right? So we it, have to make sure that the revisiting and repurposing we're doing isn't just reinforcing. Right. right. And that's the hardest part. I want to, Jose says, he's, he says, it's funny. In a narrative sense, your process reminds me a lot of comedy. Some mm. have said, some have said so. <laughs> some of my bad reviews <laughs> have I said so, but yeah, to. I don't, I, yeah. Um, you do a setup, build upon it in the expected direction and then twist it with an unexpected punchline. And that mm. is indeed one way to subvert tropes. Another way is to simply, as I you know, look from a different angle or do some of the things that um, Saladin has mentioned there, I guess what's great about it is there's many ways. We just aren't shown those in what the dominant narrative that as we like to call it. Um, so look, it's just, we're looking for those other ways and we're looking for the love we have, right? The love we have for storytelling. Yeah. And when you wed those, you, you know, that you connect. And, and that's that's just what's so gratifying is when you find that readership, that listenership, that viewership that um, has been looking for someone to connect those dots for them, right? That's been like, I I wanted this badass master thief. I needed my badass master thief lesbian story or what, whatever it is, right? That, that right. you know, I needed my my Muslim like cyberpunk hacker story you know, thank you, you know, like, like, like people, people respond, you know, people, um, they're, they're hungry still, even with all the talk around diversity and, and some of the genuine headway that's been made, um, you know, up against like decades and decades of only some kinds of stories being told. And so I feel like, like I said, we all got to do different kinds of work to, to really start to make things feel and look different. Yes. And that is actually a perfect place to say that um, we're done. And Saladin, thank you. This was um, fantastic, just thank fantastic. Oh, uh, like as I knew it would be. <laughs> I do. So. Yeah, but I have, I have <laughs> faith, I have faith. Um, so I wanna again, thank Saladin Ahmed, who, is, who was with me today. This is the last episode of season two of Narrative Worlds. Um, and I want to thank everyone who's, who was with us in person today and all of you who are watching this later on the YouTube channel. Thank you for listening to us all the way through. Um, I'm, I'll end there. For the, some of you will be going on to the writing room that happens after this on the Nebula site. And um, I hope to be back for season three. That's not determined yet, but um, we'll see. So thank you. Mm -hmm.